the time on fields and then there's the courtroom drama on the 360 agenda. Suspended Essendon coach James Hurd testifies under oath of tip-offs and threats as the Asada case begins. The Hawk Fork loses another prong. Jared Ruffhead suspended from a trip to face the Dockers for his misstep. And a triple treat on Coach's Nice. Not only Rusey and Bomber, as you've come to expect, but Alistair Clarkson is here to issue a challenge. I'm Jared Waitley. We're a good man down, but how about the replacement? He's Dermot Brereton. This Monday night, it's footy from all angles. Derm, welcome. Evening. How are you going? Good. Robbo's, Robbo's a little under the weather still. Yeah. Hasn't been since Friday. I know. Though some would say it could be viewed as self-inflicted, but I'm not too sure. <laughs> I think no. the UN's checking on symptoms of Ebola. Well, he did text us. He text us uh, at work on Saturday a picture of Robbo in bed. So, oh. See, I'm legitimately sick. And when they said... Look, he's in bed. I went, I don't want to see. I don't want to see. <laughs> Keep your distance, all right? We've got a lot to get through yep. tonight. Three coaches, it'll be great. Uh, a Monday hero by convention here, Dan. Yeah, look, they didn't have much to cheer about, the Brisbane Lions, but I just thought for the youngsters wanting to learn about the game, finer points about the game, Dane Zorko did something which I just dipped my lid to. Here he is. He handballs here to young Crisp going past. Now, he could just run along and take it easy, but he out-sprints the two opponents. Look at him. He's riding shotgun and he talks the young man through the whole procedure. I just thought that was wonderful, wonderful senior play. So Dane Zorko in a, in a teaching uh, methodology, well done. I thought it was superb. Oh, bless. Bless, Derm. You found a team that lost by 100 points. <laughs> I know. And a bloke who didn't have the footy. Didn't have it all that much either <laughs> when he did get it. But, uh, they had, didn't have much to cheer about. Oh. At that stage, they were still alive and kicking. You yeah. grade my hero here, Derm, because Footy is all about instinctive decisions. This is the best decision made all year. Jared Rivers, games on the line. This Come off the line. One. <laughs> The dog, they, they are stone cold dead if Rivers doesn't get to this ball with Hill bearing down the other way, never mind everybody else, and Pavlich loose over the back. Geelong take this down and kick a goal for Duncan. And in a game that's decided by two points at the end, the instinct to do that. But if you go, you have to impact. You, you, you must commit to it. Um, what is he, a 12-year player, something like that? If he's a three-year player, he doesn't go. Anywhere yeah. inside that, that's pure experience. He's been pretty good for them. He's not Matty Scarlett, but he's a very professional player and what they were wanting. All right, we're on alert here at Fox Footy tonight. Chris Judd is on his way to uh, be the guest on the couch. Every, nice look, honestly, if he doesn't announce that he's going on next year, there's going to be a lot of disappointed footy fans, but that's the great hope now that over the past few weeks that he's reformed a view which might have been, to call it a day, to embrace 2015. I was of the opinion, looking at Juddy, the way he's gone about his career, there's a bit of mystique about him. I actually thought he liked the little bit of the circus that went on when he came <laughs> home from... He said he was coming home from West Australia. And it was the one and only time in the history of our sport a player put himself up and, and clubs had to apply. <laughs> I thought he kind of enjoyed that. And I don't know whether in the same vein, whether he's kind of enjoyed the mystique of will he or won't he go on. He doesn't have anything to prove. We know that. And I think he's pretty comfortable in life. And he's got his eye on later years, you know, post-football as well. So he's a very logical bloke every yep. time I've met him, and it, it wouldn't have surprised me. And I probably was leaning to the the belief that he would say, oh, that's, that's enough. I'll keep it alive here. I don't want to... I was there. I'm now out here. I don't want to go out when I'm here. Yeah. I thought he might have done that. He is still good, though. To oh. watch him on Saturday was yeah. like, oh, we'd be that's... a bit shortchanged if he went out here. That's his here. Yeah. <laughs> the average bloke's good. He's yep. there. Yeah. Yep. So, no, a, Chris Judd on his way on the couch. Fingers crossed he's announcing that he goes on next year. OK, top of the agenda is dictated by the news, and that's day one in the Federal court with Essendon and James Hurd challenging the lawfulness of the long-running Asada investigation which began this morning it was it was legalese this morning the longer the day went the more it heated up 
James Heard has today given his version of events in the long-running supplement scandal. Suspended Essendon coach James Heard claims he was threatened, bullied and forced to lie. Heard has told the federal court he accepted his one-year suspension as Essendon coach under great duress and threats. Osada lacked the power to conduct an investigation jointly with the AFL in the way that it did. My client's case is that from its inception, the investigation was invalid and unlawful. Not only as anomalous, but wholly perverse. Indeed, Your Honour, the expression nonsense on stilts comes to mind. I'm not talking about anything that took place today at all. You've just got to respect the fact that it's before the court and we've still got a couple of days to go. As I said, I'm under oath and I can't comment. Sorry, guys. The legal manoeuvring was clearly highlighted by use of the phrase nonsense on stilts, which simply must become part of the football lexicon. But hmm. the day revolved around James Hurd, who went into the box after lunchtime, and if you were to boil it down to two statements, this is what you'd choose. I signed the deed of settlements under great duress, threats and inducements, and of going in to the Asada interviews, I was told to tell the truth, but not what Andrew Demetrio had said to David Evans on the 4th of February. All sworn under oath. Julian De Stoop spent the day in federal court. Uh, Jules, just give us an idea uh, of the Heard testimony and how it will be judged. Yeah, good evening, guys. Uh, look, he was, he's been waiting to talk for a long time, hasn't he, James Heard? And he certainly didn't miss uh, when he was called to the witness stand. Uh, he was on there for about just over an hour, he'll be uh, there again uh, tomorrow morning at uh, 10 o'clock. But uh, you, you picked out a couple of the key uh, things there. And look, he just he was a man that did things under sufferance last year. That was the impression that he gave from the... He didn't really want to... Uh, he said, look, he was told to tell the truth. Uh, he didn't really want to with the, with the AFL investigator because uh, he was only... Because he was threatened with the AFL uh, sanctions. And that whole discussion about Andrew Demetrio came up when he was asked about whether he knew the club had uh, called Asada in. He basically said, no, the, the only thing I was at uh, was when David Evans got off the phone from Andrew Demetrio and uh, he told me that he believed Andrew Demetrio believed the club was using performance uh, enhancing drugs. So uh, he didn't miss Andrew Demetrio. Also mentioned a conversation he had uh, with Gillan McLaughlin uh, the day after where Gillan said he believed that that was right and the club was on uh, performance enhancing drugs. And of course we know the relationship between uh, David Evans and James Hurd has soured and uh, we could see that today with him putting that on the table which also uh, put some pressure uh, on David Evans as well. So uh, James Hurd's been waiting a while and he certainly didn't disappoint today. In the testimony he repeatedly isolated himself from Essendon and this would be true from the start at the press conference which was initially called and he towed the party line reluctantly in his depiction of events all the way through to when it was suggested about bringing the game into disrepute and he made the uh, the differentiation between now Essendon brought the game into disrepute as opposed to Heard. Is It seemed, Jules, that that was a, a very deliberate line to take. Yeah, no doubt. It was interesting today just two sitting in the courtroom that uh, James and Tanya were sort of sitting back back uh, left corner and Paul Little, Xavier Campbell and uh, one of the officials, Justin Rodsky, was sort of front right. So they never really sat next uh, to each other in there as well. But yeah, he made a lot of references uh, to the fact which separated him from the club from saying on the morning of February 5, in a private conversation with David Evans, he said he didn't agree with some of the things uh, that he would later go on to say uh, at the press conference. And uh, as you mentioned there, he said that, uh, no, it wasn't me that broke rule 1.6. Uh, it was the club. And uh, he made it clear that he wasn't agreeing with a lot of things uh, that the club did and uh, he clearly believes he had nothing to hide. He, he just seemed like a man today that's been, you know, he's been angry for a while. The fact that uh, the AFL and David Evans were trying to come up with an outcome which suited them, it suited the final series and James Hurd's reputation uh, was going down the toilet uh, at the same time. But it is fascinating given that in uh, just two weeks time his suspension is up. But uh, we, you can see what the headlines are going to be tomorrow. The fact that uh, James Hurd might have come across as a little bit selfish again uh, today and that he's uh, separated himself from the club at a time where he's going to get back into work uh, there very soon. Well, he'll be back on the stand tomorrow and you'll be there, Jules, so we'll talk again tomorrow night. That issue of separation, Derm, will be... That's the fascinating that one because he's weeks one. away from returning as the coach of Essendon and yet in this legal case he is a separate entity. I know. Uh, you've got the battle lines drawn up. AFL and Asada on one side. You've got Essendon and Heard in the one camp or the other side. There's now a petition wall between Heard and Essendon. There's now the board of Essendon 
having to listen to James Heard saying he, he was given inducements and coerced into saying, making statements which he wasn't comfortable with. To me, if I'm a board member, I don't like hearing that. That's going to drive a, I said partition, a wall between me and that person. OK, that's to be continued and we'll continue with it tomorrow night. The on-field, so what difference does a kick make? There's a snakes and ladders nature to this season. The four points won and the four points lost and perhaps that was brought into sharpest focus with events at Simmons Stadium at the end on Saturday night. Sutcliffe has told the play on, not sure about that. stop because of the blood rule. Rossi Lyon is on the boundary line signalling there's four seconds for heaven's sake, David. Don't play on. Well, he's going to the sirens gone. Siren so sounded. He's going to kick it from what? Maybe 55 metres out. Monday, after the siren for the win, he must kick the goal. And he must kick it 50 metres. Drop punt on the way. Drop punt is on its way. Drop punt. on from that moment. Okay. The Dockers are no longer in the battle for the top two. They're in a pitched battle for the top four. A couple of things out of that. I reckon if you ask 21 Dockers on the night, who do you want having kicked that shot at goals so right at the uh, at the death, they'd pick David Mundy. Yep. The other thing is, I reckon for seven other teams that go into the finals now, the one horror start they would think, playing the Dockers on Subiaco. So that's now out of the question for the first week, at least. Anyway, so yeah, it's a um, yeah, it's a tough one for them to swallow. A bit of pill for them to swallow. Gee, they're, they're a brave team, aren't they? They were so willing in the last quarter. Uh -huh. As by the end, I felt like they left with the plaudits, but plaudits aren't worth anything in this year because <laughs> it's just so tight in there. That was a kick that got to money. Yes, well. yes. In your mind, where, where do they are they in premiership contention? Uh, this sounds almost trite. Not unless McFarlane can get back. Mm -hmm. I think key forwards, if you've got multiple key forwards, which not everyone has, but if you have two that are operating fairly well, I think they can do a bit of damage on, on certain grounds in the finals. And what about Geelong? Is they haven't made an error yet this year in the win-loss column. Their, their four losses have been uh, outside of the state. They're equal on points with Hawthorne and Sydney, and yet there aren't too many who put them on equal status. Yeah, and you can understand that. If you look at the, the percentages, over the season proper, there are a monster percentage behind. They haven't had the goal-kicking power. Uh, we, we spoke to Chris Scott last night, Eddie and I, and and he admitted, he said, probably, said we made our mind up and we went on with it, but we probably fired a year too early with pods. You know, but hindsight's a great thing. He says, but the club moves on. Look, they're fantastic. The one thing I, I do say about this is only two of the last six premierships have been won by the team that, that was the best team from go to woe. So whoever turns round 21, 22 in the best form and continues to let that little rise up right through to week 28, 29, they normally win the premiership. They've won four out of the last six. There's no reason why that can't be Geelong. Chris Scott's been re-engineering his team whilst keeping it at the pointy end of things and Geelong's on the brink of rewarding that with a further contract extension already with a year to run and two more to come. As this is one of the great no-brainers of our time just to <laughs> keep things away from the pointy end because in a way his, his transitional job, which he's been in since he first started, uh, he's still bringing that to fruition. The thing I know is about co coaches having played under so many and just witnessing them. Players, a lot of the time, you ask a player what was said in that meeting, he'll give you a couple of quotes. He won't recite. There's never been a player who can recite the full five-minute dialogue or even the guts of it. 
So what happens is players reflect the demeanour of their coach. This bloke's uncompromising. He will not lie down, and they know he won't lie, lie down at any stage. And I reckon they reflect him that they're going to have a go right to the death. OK, so Geelong and Fremantle had all the markers that we've come to expect in recent years, except the suspensions in the aftermath. Yeah. Because the match review panel did its work today. And Steve Johnson was cleared for uh, for the kick near the ear of, uh, of Neil. It came back from the uh, the panel as the force used was below that required to constitute a reportable offence. Yes, that is correct. But it's a bad action and I would hate to see kids in junior football utilising that now and saying it wasn't forceful enough. That happens in some areas. A melee will start in local football. That needs a sanction. Yeah, And the reason it hasn't been sanctioned in the AFL is because a one-match penalty is a monstrous, monstrous penalty to the team. It needs a sanction. Yeah, that needs a fine. That needs a, a wake-up, you idiot, fine. OK. Player with his head over the ball has been contentious the longer that the season has gone. Nathan Fife with no case to answer here. The match review panel found that there was no realistic alternate way to contest the ball and the high contact was caused by circumstances outside the player's control. So if out through this year we have diluted the duty of care to the player with his head over the ball, and this is a further representation from the panel of that. Yeah, you, you could argue the case. Is it similar to... He chose to charge at the ball then. At is the start, it that the different to charging year. into bumping someone? And that's what Nathan Fife yeah. got done for at, at the start, the start of, the of the year. Under the duty of care, your duty of care was not to make contact with the bloke's head yep. over the ball. Mm. And it's we've moved away from that, for better or for now. worse. Yep. But the player who didn't escape all of this won't be able to face Fremantle is going to be Jared Roughhead. There's a curiosity with Tripping Derm is this came back as reckless as opposed to negligent, and it would have made absolutely no difference. Is reckless, <laughs> reckless and negligent in this case both earn 80 points, and the only reason Roughhead misses is because he's got 64 carryovers. And when we look at the carryover um, footage again now, when he bumped uh, Guthrie off the ball, or blocked him in that final last year, and then he took that so he could play on in the finals the next week, that's what's done him. That's the, the aftermath of the carryover points has done him, so that's what everybody up and out. Next year, that won't be the case. Those carryover we points... We believe. Yeah, so if Mark Evans has his way, those carryover points wouldn't affect here, and a, a misdemeanour would simply be a reprimand. It might even be a fine, but it wouldn't be the one-week suspension that it is. It's amazing what different codes tolerate. Now, that's not tolerated in ours, in, in rugby league. They look at it and laugh and say, get up and carry on. <laughs> and in basketball, you get a um, you get a foul, and you've got four more. <laughs> you carry on. But that gets him a week. And for a bloke who's probably, I would estimate here, on half a million. He, that, that game's probably worth twenty-five dollars to $30,000 worth of match payments. Mm -hmm. If you trip somebody up like that in the street and you're found guilty of willful conduct in that way, you're probably going to get a $400 fine, not twenty-five dollars to 30000 You can bounce this around with Alistair Clarkson <laughs> shortly. Uh, the ladder, everything gets measured through the prism of the ladder at this stage, and our focus here is from <coughs> 7 to 12, because you couldn't have concocted a set of results to deliver where we are now. It's great, isn't teams it? to squeeze into two. All right, so on the Hungry Jacks 360 seconds clock, because I've been warned about you, so you're on the clock here. Oh. Let's go. The Crows, who jumped three places, added a massive amount of percentage at a really handy time of year, and they dismembered a team that had been earning plaudits over a number of mm. weeks. Did the Crows enhance their reputation? Yes, they can turn it on when they choose to, but if somebody turns it up against them, sometimes their midfield can be found wanting when they defend. But I think of all the teams outside of that top five or six, the Crows move the ball the best from one end of the ground to the other, now, which a, makes them dangerous. There's a cruel part to it as they lost Andy Otten and that looks like an ACL, so that's such a pity for him. And then there was uh, there was Tom Lynch who that was horrifying in the moment that that happened and we might raise that with the coaches and yeah. just ponder whether this is a wake up call for the competition. But the Crows are giving themselves every chance with Richmond, North Melbourne and St Kilda to The best is good but it's not as good as the top four. Okay, Essendon, did they fumble their chance? That, that was, it felt like on Friday night that was on their racket. Well, Bomber believes they did. He said their best footy is capable of matching it with Sydney. They, they gave it to Hawthorne in a quarter earlier in the year. Uh, 
They've got two talented, well, they've got one talented forward in Carlisle, who to me is still not a natural forward. He's capable of doing some damage, and by God, the kid's got talent. I'd, you'd want to see them build depth through the midfield in the off season. That man who will have to probably come straight back in, Joe Watson. And they've got West Coast, Gold Coast, Carlton. Possession's nine-tenths of the law, but they run straight into West Coast. So it'll probably be determined this week. Haven't they switched on too? Yeah, we'll I know it's them. the Essendon minute, but they've switched on West Coast. Collingwood. Now, <clears throat> how are they so lacklustre in a game that... It had so much in it, they travel well. And whether they won or not wasn't really the point, but how did they front up in that manner? I don't know whether it's the ground because of how long it is, whether it's spread them too much, but they just seem to be, you know, the Chinese checkers, you get on a roll and you keep overlapping and you jump one and you get to the next and then you can move to the next. They just kept overlapping, jumping with possession Collingwood. And their back line, they've got two really young ruckmen. You've got the young ruckman there, Wits, and Grundy's still back in the Magoos. They've got two really young backmen. They conceded 55 inside 50s and they gave up almost 20 goals. So they've given up 40% of their inside 50s have gone to goals and all up 60% of the inside 50s went to scores. 19 something whatever it was, 30 something. So it was a huge return for how many times they went in. These kids who were down back. Those two key position lads have been super, but it's getting a little tiring for them now. I don't think from those six up to the next six in the midfield, I think those front six midfielders don't defend as good as some of the other higher ranked teams and make it a little bit easier for those back six. All right, Gold Coast. Now, I get all the talk that they're a one-man team, no Ablett, no Suns, but with the gaping opportunity that opened up for them after Essendon had lost, and they've missed the chance to go into the eight a game clear. To front up in the first 15 minutes the way they did, that's not personnel. That they didn't meet their obligations as league footballers individually or collectively, so are they out of business? I think... It... <sighs> Yeah, I reckon they're pretty well cooked. <laughs> Sorry to say it. When we saw some of their efforts a, a couple of weeks ago in that early game against Brisbane, that was horrendous. And you thought, look, this might be just an abomination that's bobbed up and, and yep, yeah, let's cancel it out. Yeah, they know they don't have Gary. They'll make a, another drive at it. Once again, I think the mindset of a very, very young group and even though some of those lads are playing up to around 50 to 70 games now, there's not enough real older, wiser heads amongst them to go, drag, come with me, I'll show you what's required. I would have understood it more if they'd started there and then... And dropped away. But to start here? Yeah. Oh, that, mm. I didn't like that. West yeah. Coast, have they made the breakthrough? Is this the West Coast team we expected? I actually had them like bottom four, bottom okay. five. You know, I, I just thought their midfield wasn't deep enough, but they found a few. Hutchings has done really well in there. Prittis continues to amaze. Most people would say, oh, Prittis, he finds the ball, but he's not all that special. He is special. He's special. He's a wonderful, wonderful player. They have a brilliant skeleton of a team that they can implant some real talent into and drive up the ladder next year. So they've got Essendon, Melbourne and Gold Coast. So if they do come to Melbourne and beat the Bombers, they'll see the finals, I think. And then there's Richmond. <laughs> How deluxe <laughs> is this? And the question surrounding Richmond with the possibilities here is, is this the ultimate tease? Uh, this is the type of situation where you picture somebody sitting back on a big reclining leather couch and say, come in here and tell me about your childhood. <laughs> and a Richmond supporter sits on it. And they say, why have they done it to me again? They are, if you buy a Rich Richmond membership, you get full value. <laughs> Fair enough. You, you, you're not getting a premiership. You don't get the ultimate glory. But if you want to talk about learning human emotions, go yep. out and buy a Richmond membership and ride it. Yep, you're entitled to microwave it and frame it. <laughs> sometimes in the same year. In fact, when Richmond hand out those memberships, they should frank another two or three just to give the member the entitlement to do that. OK, those are the teams squeezing for those seventh and eighth places, and that's going to be such a narrative towards the end of this season. Let's bring in the coaches. Mark Thompson is one who's involved in that squeeze, and Paul Roos would have a view on the top team in the comp, having faced them on the weekend. A little bit of anger 
bomber there, yeah. The PR department told me to be positive. It's hard to be positive when you lose the game to Richmond who wanted to win more than us to play finals. I don't think it really matters about the results sometimes. How we really matter tonight is how we played. When, when, when are you going to change? When is it going to happen? Where you take yourself from an average team into a team that consistently plays finals and you can handle the stage and you look the same every week. When, when, when? Because they do it in patches. It's not as if I just said to them, it's not as if they can't play. They've just had quarters of football against the best team. We were within 10 points last night, last week against Sydney, based on 20 minutes of football. Just smashed them in the third quarter. We can play. What, make, what makes a team fluctuate? That's what I'm trying to unlock. Done a lot of talking this week to the players. Probably too much. Maybe that's why they lost. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh. Makes you angry. It was like being taken in behind those closed doors where the players spent 45 minutes. So, Bomber, welcome. Yeah, it's had you. Good to have you back, mate. Nice to be here. Yeah, first night back and your buddy's gone. <laughs> so hello, hello, hello. Have you done much of this stuff, have you? <laughs> None. No? No, no of not. <laughs> yeah, you just treat me with kid gloves. You're really. better looking than Rob only. <laughs> That's not <laughs> a... <laughs> and, Rusey, um, when you watch Bomber in yeah. that mode, is that's, that's as honest as a coach is. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And I'm probably surprising sometimes coaches get criticised for being pretty honest after the after the yeah. press conference. Um, he's just responding to questions and I'm oh, still in game mode, Ruzi. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not that on. it's not that long yeah. afterwards as well, particularly if you go first. But um, I think it's a really good insight, as you mm. said. You know, I think uh, as an opposition coach, certainly Essendon, their best. I mean, mm. the first quarter against us, I think we had 14 inside 50s to two, I think, at one stage. You know, so their best has been very, very good this year. There's no question about that. Would you take any of that commentary back? No, no, that's pretty honest, it's truthful. Well, that's what we are working on, and that's what we have to become. Well, you can't have those quarters. Mm. You, know, you can't fluctuate so much in games, do it. Like, that's what the good teams don't do that. Hmm. Have you? I look at blokes and the makeup of your team. There's a few blokes that tier underneath it Zaharakis, Melksham, Collier. To me, you need those blokes, and everybody talks about the next step, and I hate using cliches. Yeah. But those boys really are the lifeblood of your team. Should the team take the next step, they have to first. They're the most influential, aren't they? Because they're the ones that know the older blokes and what their habits are and how, where they've come from, but they're also educating the young ones on, on their, Which is their, delicate. their introduction to football. Yeah. Because if, if, if they're not right on the same track as those older leaders, yep. they can certainly lead the 18-year-olds on a wrong path. The wrong way, yeah. No, that's very, uh, you're right. It's, uh, and they've they, they got the, the, um, the uh, talent to do it. And I'm, they've got, they're good people. So we just have to find them the, the tools to do it. And I've been trying all year to find them. Uh, so far, it's sort of, I haven't found them. You know, I haven't un un unlocked the key, yeah. the lock. Mm. So that question of when is it going to happen, and you've both faced it before. Mm. You've both brought teams through successfully with Geelong and Sydney. How does it happen? Does it suddenly happen? You, you get them to a point and then you have to wait them out, or how does it evolve? It varies from player to player, but I suppose, I mean, it's I remember one game against the Eagles for the Swans and I reckon that was the catalyst. We got smashed in 2005 and in the midst of the, the storm and I don't know how or why but that seemed to be the catalyst. The yeah, that seemed to be the moment. They I, believed. When I look back on that, I think they were just fed yeah. up with being a, yeah. an average team and I think that was the moment. If I look back on... What year was that? That was 2005 when we went on and won the Premiership. Yeah. But it was about around five or six or seven or something. We'd been belted by the Eagles yeah. and we went on, obviously beat them in the in the Premiership, but I mean that was sort of two and a bit years after we we're into the into the journey. So it, it, it varies. I mean, some players, because I mean, as you know, Dermot, you've got 22 blokes running out there, so you, you can't have 15 in the right mindset and seven that aren't. And it's just that weight of numbers. Who got the um, 2008 
core of the team. You know, you, Hodgy, who else got drafted that time, that period? Um, but along so, the, you, you, was, you, you took up to Sydney, the left footer. Um, Stewie Jew, uh, yeah. he, he Jew, came, yeah, so yeah. he's pretty good for them. The way Jordan, he Jordan Lewis, Jordan Lewis uh, rough head, rough head, rough head, head Franklin, Franklin, yeah. and Crowd yeah. held up the back half. Yeah, Crowd yeah. yeah. back half. There's, a, they there's a, like a whole there, group of players, that's, and some of them are still playing now, that's still holding the team together. Hodgie's been a revelation, and he's been an absolute superstar. Alice is coming in, but I actually thought it sometimes, and probably speaking from personal experience, there's, there's a time when you go, oh, I'm so sore, and you never come good again. Yeah. I, th I thought from the outside, Hodgie might have been that player yeah. 12 months ago. But the resilience of the bloke yeah. to get to where he has been over the last two seasons has been freakishly yeah. good. Yeah, he's hobbling, wasn't he, with his knees and everything. Yeah, yeah. groins. Yeah. groins. Uh, will you bring Joe Watson straight back in? Do you know the answer to that yet? Joe said I have to. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, we do. We will, mate. We need him. Um, yeah, it's, they've done really well without him. And he's a great leader and he's a great uh, stoppage player. So that's what we really need, someone in there with great hands. Um, we haven't... Oh, we've just, we hope we've done enough work with him, with the balls. Uh, he only just started kicking last week, but... Uh, it's his hands in stoppages we really need and his leadership mm. what and his mean? energy and excitement yeah, like yeah. he's excited to play yeah, again. and the players will get a boost happening yeah. back in the team I mean it, how much is that tangible or in but I, I, I'd, I'd suspect for your boys just to have him back in the locker room and have yeah. him back running down the ground would be pretty big yeah. what do you make of the rejuvenation of next week's opponents the Eagles that they were good they're not the pushover they were going to be six weeks ago well they kicked 120 points the last two weeks so oh. they're on a goal kicking feast um, yeah, what do you think of them I like them, yeah. I don't want to pump them up too much, do I? <laughs> I can't. <laughs> That's not what we do, Roos, is it? Like, we you respect them. Yeah. People forget early in the year, they'll play. we play them in round two. And they, I think they won their first three games. They yeah. were playing really good football in the first three rounds of the season and then sort of dropped off. It's amazing, isn't it? Like when yeah. they realised they weren't playing finals and then yeah, Carlton, yeah, that's right. um, it, it they just come back and play, yeah. you know, football, yeah. carefree football, it works. Well, uh, some pl teams yeah. play free. Your old team, not your playing team, but Geelong. I always thought Geelong was super dangerous when they believed they weren't going to make the finals because yeah. they back in the 80s yeah, they, they used to throw it around yeah. side to side and we'd go we're confused yeah. where's it going you couldn't stop them yeah. Yeah. and suddenly they'd sneak into the finals yeah. and do some damage yeah. I ask you on that with your demons I know that there's a progress you want to make with them and there's it's a clear defined path that's ahead of them when should the next step of their learning evolution come in when can they start roll the dice because yeah. the kid has ability and he wants to actually blossom. Yeah, I reckon we've got the defensive side down reasonable and I think we've been really working the last month to, to, to six weeks offensively. So, you know, with only three weeks to go in the season, we're now talking both and balance and, and trying to get both right. So that's probably been the biggest challenge for us. Um, I thought on the weekend for, for three quarters again we're, we're pretty good and we started to move the ball a lot better. But I suspect it's going to take another pre-season for us to really you know, nail it down and get the, the, the guys working together and, and you know they'll know all the drills going in the next pre-season. We're you know, bringing in new drills and, and all those sorts of things. So look, hopefully if we get through another really good pre-season with no injuries, no off-season uh, surgeries. Because the, the times it's not sound like I'm taking I'm, over the show. No, it sounds like I'm stalking him, but the times I've gone and watched your training, you did a lot of ball work on run and spread, yep. which is attacking football, yep. yet we don't see that same measure out on the ground. Yeah, I think because we're working a lot harder defensively, I don't think that once you get the game day, you, you've got to do both. So training you can work on your defensive stuff and then you move into your offensive stuff so you've got a bit of a breather between drills i think the, the biggest challenge for our guys is just that two-way running you know i think the commitment they're making now to running defensively is a lot greater but at the expense you can see when we get the ball sometimes like oh, the whole air goes out of the stadium oh fantastic we've got the ball now but the problem is you kick it down the line you, you got to defend again so it's certainly something you know we, we're talking about and working on but i think as i said it's just that absolute gut running in, in afl footy that you have to do. Mm. Did you give him a pretty ferocious week? 
leading in? Um, we had a, I mean, an honest week. You know, we had a really honest week, and you know, players. Uh, I think it's it's fairly new to the guys to to look at their own games and, and assess their own games and talk to their teammates about how they felt they went. So mm. it's a, a big week in that regard, and it's all part of their learning curve. Uh, look, they were really disappointed against uh, Brisbane Lions, but probably more just the skill errors. I was yeah. talking to Bomber about it before. Just you know, the skill errors, providing the efforts there. I think as a coach, you get frustrated with skill errors, but you're more concerned that there's no effort. So I thought on the weekend we were really good with effort. We just got beaten by a better team on the weekend. That's the theme we've got to continue for, for three weeks. Talent is such a hard thing to find. Real raw talent. Mm. So Liam Jarrell, there's romanticism in football clubs. Is there any romantics at Melbourne who say, should we open the door for Liam Jarry? He's kicked 14 again. <laughs> if you could do that in AFL footy, you'd be a get back in. Look, I, I really don't know, to be honest. We haven't, we've had some list management stuff, but I haven't really heard his name brought up. I know the boys, um, a few of the boys caught up with him when we went up to, uh, to Alice Springs, just the, the teammates and things like that, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, they look, I wouldn't think so. I mean, he's been out of football now for a fair he's while. Not in, is he? No, he's released. He's, he's released. He got released recently, yeah. 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 Um, give us an independent appraisal of Hawthorne. Thorn. You probably didn't get their best, but we're three weeks out, they're the top team on the ladder. I think their ball movement, time and space, I mean, it's very, very hard to get the ball back off them. I mean, they're as skillful a side as I think I've ever well, I've ever played. Geelong under Bomber, and still Geelong, but yeah. probably the Geelong have missed a few real class players some now. some very good teams around, aren't they? Sydney yeah. and Hawthorne. Hawthorne, just, I'd um, say Hawthorne's probably the best ball movement team yeah. in the in the competition. You just can't afford to give them any time and space because they haven't got many guys that can't kick the football yeah. and, and hit targets. You know, you can see you know, even when it's it's low, it's in front, you know, someone can run on it. I think their cohesion offensively, they all move. As soon as they win the ball, they all move. You know, not many teams do that. Do uh, they fatigue you because of their offensive run? Uh, and, well, you can, and you yeah. can't and you can't be offensive when you somehow do well, get it. Well I think it. a lot of times when they run, they run you out of position and they say well if you don't run with me I'll get it so you and run you just with do me a lot of running because you can't get the ball off that's right yeah. Like, yeah yeah exactly that's yeah. not much fun it's weird but it's <laughs> it's 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 just yeah. logical isn't it yeah, yeah it is yeah. no it is <laughs> let me ask you if you're in Nathan Buckley's situation such an important game a lot of time to think about it you go they play like that you poll in the aftermath against effort and attitude mm. not one player can put their hand up satisfied with effort and attitude do you, what does it do to you as a coach it's, we sit here and go, how did they come out and play like that? But he must be saying, how did they come out and play like that? Oh, he'd be saying more than that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's hard work when, they, when your team plays like that. And that happens all the time. It would have happened at Geelong when we had really good years. You know, you might have still won the game then, but like just not played well, you know. And, um, yeah, just, you just have days like that. And it just you makes you angry. Do you attack their defence? I mean, do you really take it on? Is, is a lot of your planning around how to pull... Have they got a young back line? Yeah, they're a pretty young team all, overall, aren't they, yeah. really? Like, there's, yeah. you look at that Collingwood team and you think, well, where are all the names that you're just so used to hearing? Yeah, they're not there. Yeah. So, you know, we well, might be expecting too much. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, frust I mean, it's frustrating, Jared, but... Yeah, yeah, it's a long season and, and every team goes through, unless you're at the absolute pointy end, you know, you're talking about Sydney and you're talking about Hawthorne, Geelong, you know, top four teams. I don't think Freo have dipped as much as perhaps what people, but I mean, Collingwood is sort of that going for fifth to ninth, so it's not like they are uh, you know, going into the season that they would have had the, the leeway at some of those top yeah. teams. So look, at so You get angry, don't you? But you sort of get over think, it quick well, too. I think, Monday, I think Monday yeah. Bucks goes in and thinks, look, hopes that's one out of the one out of the box. Yeah. You know, it's a long year, young team, one out of the box. You get angry after the game, then you analyse Bomber and, yeah. and I reckon you move on pretty quick from yeah. that one. Before you go for this one, you, you mentioned anger. Yeah. If you had your weekly chat with him last week, if you see Stevie J this week <laughs> oh, mate. kicking the bloke in the head, what do you say? Well, I knew that was going to happen. Because <laughs> <laughs> you just sort of knew, didn't you? Like, they went after him, didn't they? The poor yeah. bugger. Yeah. But he actually was amongst the two, wasn't he? He was given as much back, was he? Yeah. Did yeah. you see it? Yeah. 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 Mind you, when you <laughs> they like, ripped his jumper off, oh, they didn't own it. But that, <laughs> that's the sort of little stuff that, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he can't do. Fair or not, Is he, he 
if right. that happened right. to you and you played, you'd, would you fire back? Uh, would you, you would have ended up getting four or five oh. weeks for something. But well, they yeah. probably loved you, respected you. They yeah. would have done that to you. He shirt fronted me once. Did he? He yeah. never forgive me for that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was running. I didn't see him. I was running to someone else and just accidentally knocked him over. I've got one, uh, he, one that might he's be... A, he's very good to watch. The like, camera's on him half the game, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Just the Tom Lynch incident from yesterday, and I don't know if you've seen this, but no. have a look. This is the, the frightening head-high contact. Mm. This is the player who keeps his head low, playing for the free kick, and for five minutes here I think everyone was just feeling mm. sick. Is this a moment where we as a football community can try to do something with the players? What, uh, what do you think when, when that happens? Yeah, I think the AFL, one of the things uh, with the rules, I think they were trying. Now, again, with the, I don't want to be critical, but there's been such a a variation of rules, and you've touched on it here, Jared, over the course of the year. But it's certainly something the AFL have, have really worked hard on over the last five or six years, even to the point where I think they, they were going to give free kicks away for guys that got up and back down from memory. Now I don't know how many the, the they've given for the, 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 yeah, the play, search for the free, for kick. The free yeah. kick. So yeah, look, you just hope instinctively guys stand up and don't bob back down again. I think we've got to continue to protect the guy when he has got his head over the ball and I think I heard you talk earlier that's yep. maybe a bit blurry now as well. But, but Have they been looking for something but they haven't found it because it might be too hard or it's not there? I don't know. Is there, is this, there some, has someone got a good one, alternative? This one sits with the players. Yeah, I think so. Is that, they yeah. have to, you, you have to take responsibility for your own safety. Well, I think a I free kick, don't know, that's who not worth it, a free kick. Uh, yeah, no, that Brisbane player. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really know. Talk but about I was, I was saying, Jen, I would think he was expecting that guy to come up, yep. and, and I don't think at all he could have done anything. Some of the ones we can debate, and we probably have this year. But I would suggest he's come in. Lynch has got time to get up, and he's thinking he's going to stand up, and I'll just wrap him up, and you know, I'll probably be a ball up. The yeah. danger is if he turns side on, then the then the impact is yeah, concentrated cool. on and the that's head. The good, that's the good mm. part, is Clark. They self yeah, 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 that's yeah. right. So yeah. it's really on the player in the position. Not to, that's not worth a freak. But Don't you, keep your head down. No, nah, get, get, yeah, get up. Have you seen a good alternative, like an answer? to? Well, the only alternative would be to follow through with what Ruzi just said and to, if you do, put your head back down, pay a free kick against you. So yeah. take away not only the incentive of getting the free kick, mm. but penalising you for doing it. I don't know how, yeah. how practical that no, is. No. This, this is really on the players to figure out for themselves, I think. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, I, th I think it's just, yeah, as I said, I mean, that no Brisbane good. player would have expected him plenty of time, grab the ball, Lynch, and I'm sure Lynch, once he looks at it, thankfully he's, he's fine, and that's, yep. I guess, the main part about it. He would just say, look, next time I'm going to pick the ball up and... Yeah. and How lucky are we, though, that that doesn't happen more often mm. in the game of footy? Well, I was going to go back down when Ruzi was right about <laughs> <laughs> and back to go back down again. Yeah, last go Stesson and Heritage. <laughs> well, this is it. They, they, they think that I'm the next Kevin Sheedy or something because they've given me and Sheed started this I think didn't he, yeah, oh, he right. West yeah, Coast yeah, and he's yeah, just yeah. gone yeah, what's well. he going he's gone yeah. <laughs> 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 whatever he did you know that face on game face all right. they, uh, they want all our supporters to bring their scarves and do it every, I don't know when but uh, why don't we do it every, every goal we kick right I've got to bring Ooh. Clarko in thank you good luck <laughs> Alistair right, Clarkson next on AFL 360 the Hawks coach is fronting a key campaign he's got a little challenge for an absent friend Sends it back inside 55 oh. over the top with a beauty from four deep.
action from the weekend. Alistair Clarkson, the Hawthorne coach, is with us tonight on AFL 360. Al, welcome. Hi, Jared. Hi, Dan. How are you? How you going, uh, you're lending your voice to a, a new campaign with the Coaches Association, the Chemist Warehouse Men's Health Week. Yeah, Men's Health Week this week, and um, we're trying to encourage people to give up the gaspers, um, the cigarettes, and um, we're pretty keen on catching up with mm, Robbo tonight. Good luck. But, uh, He's, uh, I hope it's not a smoking-induced uh, illness that he's got tonight. Look, the, the thought of him being more healthy has made him sick. So it, he's watching. I've worded him yeah, up to make sure he's this watching. This one right here. Yeah. Robbo, I've got... Uh, it's called the trade of a lifetime, Robbo. And we've got the... Uh, you've got to go into a chemist warehouse store and trade in a gasper for a pack of these Nicorette uh, patches. And uh, I want to set you the challenge, mate, that... Uh, by the end of the final series in about six or seven weeks that you've given up the darts would be great for you um, but also a great example for many of us out there i'm sure that me and Dem and others like you um, may have uh, got on the fags if we wouldn't have played a lot of footy in our, in our lives, but, um, mate, it'll do you a hell of a lot of good if you can get off those gaspers. So, so it's a swap? Well, it's a swap. You're it taking a, a pack of cigarettes and they'll give you a pack of these? Or no, just one cigarette. One cigarette for yeah. a pack of these? And uh, they call it the trade of a lifetime. <laughs> and... Um, yeah. Robbo will end up looking like, looking like a scarecrow. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that'd be great, Robbo. If you could do, uh, if you do that, mate, it'd be uh, it'd be good for our uh, promotion of our campaign. But it'd be also great for your health, mate, which is important for Being us all. Being part of the campaign, Alistair, how much has it had to do with what you've gone through this year, and uh, and maybe a moment of enlightenment in, in any man's life? Yeah, I think. Uh, well, I said I said to the press conference we were having today on, in launching this campaign that um, when you're involved in in league footy um, you play for 10 years or so and you when you get through that you feel like you're nearly bulletproof because you've had to endure so many challenges both physically and mentally and um, and but you, you nearly become apathetic in a sense for your, through your 30s and 40s perhaps and uh, my my illness brought it home to me a little bit that I needed to look after myself a bit better, albeit I didn't know, you know, this, this was just so bizarre and random, the, the illness that I got. But um, the fact that I was um, out of action for a period of time sort of made me realise that I have to look after myself a, a little bit better. and. Um, and that, but it's it's more so to do with, um, yeah, you know, my family, my mates, um, my colleagues at work. Um, just uh, whether it's to do with alcohol, whether it's to do with smoking, whether it's to do with drugs, um, you know, diet, all all those things about the way that you live is just so important. And um, as men and proud um, egomaniac uh, Australian men, um, we're we're pretty apathetic and blasé in regard to. Uh, our health. I think our generation's better. My father's generation was a lot worse than what we are. We're a bit more, um, you know, I, I can't recall my father ever going to a doctor, uh, for instance. So um, I think our generation's a little bit better than that, but um, but still, I think there's a, there's an apathy towards men's health. It's a, it's a great point, though, no matter what your parents do. A bloke who's a coach of a team, and that goes down to local football, I mean, you get a 16-year-old boy and a 17-year-old boy, or 18-year-olds like you, the standards you set at a footy club and the older players set for them at a footy club, that carries right through their life. Yeah, we'd, we'd, we'd like to think so, Dan. I mean, there's, there's 18 coaches that are putting their um, putting their face to this campaign and uh, hopefully it will permeate through, obviously, AFL footy, but um, stretching right through our football communities. Um, yeah, and it's it's like I can remember, you know, looking up to as you said, role models. You know, when I, when I was a kid, you know, um, guys having a, a ciggy at half time and um, and several cans after the game. You know, you just grew up in that environment. I'm sure that um, had I not had this great aspiration to go on and play league footy, that I could have ended up like that too. My brother certainly did. Um, but then I'd you had <laughs> big big John Kennedy as well. That would that would have been a step in the other direction. Yeah, that's right. right. We're so, on to Robbo. That's oh, I'm with you. No, yeah. I'm a Big John, who's yeah, yeah. straight down the yeah. line, yeah, yeah. All right, now I want to see if I can raise your blood pressure just here, though. Jared Ruffhead's going to miss uh, Sunday night because of carryover points. Now, this is something that will probably be rectified next year. Is is that unfair? Um, well, I don't. 
it, it, it is what it is in a sense. This, we, we know the rules and we play within them um, or try to as best we can. Um, if it gets changed, albeit it will be unfortunate for guys like um, Nat Fife and Ruffy and those guys that have perhaps been penalised throughout the course of this year. If, it, um, if it's something that they've recognised is a weakness in the current system and they look to improve it, that's a good thing for the game. Now, for those uh, guys that um, suffer the consequences at the present time, it's not so great. But uh, anything that works towards a system being better, then I think it's a good thing. So Does Jack Gunston come in mm. for him? Will he? Uh, Jack, will be, Jack will be a chance to play. He's probably more so on the on the doubtful side than, than being able to play. And we won't rush him and take a risk if he's right to go and he trains fully throughout the course of this week. But his progress from that has been really pleasing and we'll just see how he goes throughout the course of the week. Is it a seven-week final series for you, Al, with that run of Fremantle, Geelong and Collingwood? Yeah, it's a, listen, it's a, uh, we, had, we had a similar sort of campaign leading into last year's final series as well and um, I'd love to be guaranteed the three wins because if you were you'd love to have a build up like that you know the, it prepares you enormously well for, for finals um, but we're still in the um, we're still in the, the mode of just trying to get points and win games and to finish as high as we can so we, we can't afford to drop those three games otherwise we even risk dropping out of the top four so um, that's going to that's gonna make it tough but um, if you're going to if you're going to compete in finals and win it at the end of September then um, if you can get through that period, then it'll hold us in really good stead. Terrific. Thanks for coming by and issuing the challenge, and I'll hit Robbo up tomorrow. Yeah, good on you. Well, thanks to uh, Fox <laughs> Footy for allowing us to come on and uh, promote Chemist Warehouse and the great campaign they've got with this uh, with this um, trade of a lifetime in the, the Nicorette patches. Thank you. Good stuff. I know you sat down with Mike Sheehan yesterday, so there's some really in-depth stuff coming in the lead-up to what's ahead on Sunday night when Paul Fawn plays Fremantle. Tomorrow night it's Players' Night. Jordan Lewis will be here, Bob Murphy as well as they uh, count down toward the end of the home and away season. So coming up next on Fox Footy, Chris Judd is the special guest on the couch. There's great expectations surrounding that. Derm, you're heading for the snow tomorrow? Yeah, so you go up there for the day, up to Mount Buller and uh, have a bit of fun up there. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how Robbo takes on the challenge too. Mm. I reckon you'll, in the words of James Hurd, he'll need inducements. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice, great to have you here. Cheers, mate. That's it from 360. Let's head on the couch with Jared Healy. <laughs>